this morning. If you have your Bibles, you're going to be turned to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Our emphasis today is the fact that I love my church because we believe and emphasize the family. When we think about family, we think about the word home. What a beautiful word that is, the word home. I, I hope whenever you say that word home and you think about home, I hope it brings great memories to you. I hope it causes you to smile. I hope it causes you to rejoice because of the parents you had, the mother you had, because of the fellowship you enjoyed. That's my hope and my desire. But for some people, when they think about home, it's not, it's not pleasant. It's just a reality. It's a difficult place for them to live, to survive, and everything. And if you experience that, I'm sorry that you experience that, but but God gives grace to live beyond that, amen? And, and I, I want to talk to you today about what a home is supposed to be and, and what God establishes as His home whenever we get to be there one day. And we get to enjoy today because if you know Jesus, you're adopted into His family. You're part of His family. You're part of His home. So we're going to do a a brief survey of some passages in the Bible, so you'll need to be looking those up if you can. Some we'll look up, some I'll just give you to write down to look up later. We'll look at a, a brief survey of, of the home and talk about what the home represents or fill in the blank. Home is a place for something. Home is a place for something. First thing I want to see here in Mark chapter 5 is that home is a place for belonging. Write that down. Home is a place for belonging. Now you're a part of something. You're a part of a special people. You're a part of somebody who cares for you and that you care about. It's found here in Mark chapter 5. The story is about the Gadarean demoniac. Remember that story? Jesus comes over and here's this man who is demon-possessed. He's so demon-possessed, he he can't be controlled by anyone. He can't control himself. He lives out among the, in the tombs, and he cuts himself. They try to chain him. They can't chain him. He is in a mess. But when he encounters Jesus, Jesus does a miraculous thing, casts out all those demons. He comes to his sanity. He becomes the man he's supposed to be. And he, at that point in time, he expresses a desire, a desire that he would he would go and follow Jesus. That, that's what he wanted to do. Just, just let me follow you, Jesus. But Jesus tells him something different. It's here in Mark chapter 5, verse 17. And they began to entreat him, talking about Jesus, to depart from their region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was entreating him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him, but he said to him, now listen to these words. Go home, go home to, circle these words, your people. Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went off and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. There's something in each and every one of us where we want to be a part of someone's place or something. There's something in us that, that says we need to belong. We want to have our people. <laughs> it doesn't really matter where that is or what it is. It's just inside of us that we need that, that we want that. Uh, let me give you an example of that. For instance, have you ever had anybody from your hometown who became famous? And, man, you hear that person either is a professional athlete or they've done something in the Olympics or done something, but you find out they're from your hometown. You haven't ever met them. They wouldn't know you from Adam's house cat. But you are bosom buddies with them. You can't wait to go tell everybody that, that you know, we, we belong together because we are from the same hometown. We go beyond that, don't we? I mean, what happens if we're from the same state? Man, do you know that they're from Alabama? Isn't that true? 
We're, we're so proud of the fact that we can have some relationship with people, whether it be our city, whether it be our state, or whether it be our family. Man, you let one of our family members do something, and we're all a part of belonging, aren't we? Whenever those things happen, like, you know, when somebody plays a sport and they go to their hometown and they have all these tickets, there are about 50 or 60 people. They don't even usually go to the ball game, but there's all of these people coming. They're all family. Because why? We belong, man. One of the saddest things this year is when they had the Winter Olympics. Y'all, y'all see any of those Winter Olympics? And those people would win gold medals and their families weren't there. Because of COVID, they couldn't be there. So they'd have to see their families on the television screen or video screen. They'd be waving at each other and crying and everything. And, and it was so sad because they belong to one another. They're a part of your people. But they couldn't be together in that time of celebration. There's something inside of us that says we need or want to belong. That's what family's for. That's why family. Family is precious because we get to belong to somebody. We get to belong to our parents. We get to belong to our siblings. We get to belong to our children. We get to belong to our aunts and uncles. We're a part of your people. And as a church, we want to emphasize that. As a church, we want to build up family. As a church, we want you to to be encouraged to belong to your people. And even that, as a church, if you don't have your people, we want to be your people. Amen? We want to be your people because inside of your heart, there is this need to belong. When that Gadarene demoniac said, Jesus, let me follow you, he says, no, you go home. And when you go home, you're going to find your people. And you tell your people what great things God has done. So one thing that a home is, it's a place for belonging. I have my identity, I have my position, my place in life. Be thankful for that. Sometimes it's more challenging for other people than for some. But be thankful. God never makes a mistake. He gives you that family, gives you those people. They're your people for you to love, for you to care for, for you to belong to. Well, not only is family a place for belonging, uh, the family, our home, is a place for safety and protection, or protection and safety. I want, I want to show you that. Turn your books, uh, book your Bible to Exodus. If there's a place that we ought to be safe, it ought to be in our home. Amen? We ought to have the freedom to be safe in our home. It, this is a story found in Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, let me give you the setting of where we're talking about protection and safety. This is in the time when Pharaoh is holding the children of Israel captive, and Moses, you know, goes and tells him, let my people go, and he doesn't want to do that. Then they have the ten plagues, and the last of those plagues is going to be the death angel. You remember that? The death angel is going to go throughout Egypt and going to kill The firstborn of all the people or all the animals is going to kill all the firstborn. But he he tells God tells them that there's a way for the children of Israel to escape that. Remember, it's called the Passover. He he commanded them to take a lamb, a paschal lamb, and to kill that lamb and to take the blood and to put that blood over the lintel and the doorpost of the house. And if they would do that. They would be protected, they would be protected from the death angel passing over. The Jews to this day celebrate Passover, same time we celebrate Easter. They celebrate Passover because they celebrate the time that the death angel passed over them because they were under the blood. Because they were under the blood. Let me me show you where he gives the instruction about that. It's found in verses 22 and 23. Listen to what he said. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. That's important. This is verse 23. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, 
the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. What was their house? What was their home? Their home, as long as it was under the blood of the Lamb, their home was a place of safety and protection. That's what our homes are supposed to be. It's supposed to be a place where we're safe, where we're protected by Almighty God, where we depend upon Him to keep us and to keep us safe. Now, sometimes in this world, when that gets violated, when intruders violate, that's a horrendous thing for somebody to interfere or to break in or to do things for our home. We as the church and we as the people of God believe that God has told us that that should be a safe and protected place. And we want to keep that that way, amen? And we want to encourage it that way, that if there's going to be one place that we can rest and one place that God's going to watch over us, it's going to be in our homes. Do you have that? you have that sense that you're safe in your home? Could I, could I encourage you to do something? Would you, would you constantly and forever... Remember to pray that the blood of the Lamb, oh, not literally the blood of that Paschal Lamb, but the blood of the Lamb of Christ will be over your doorpost and your lintel. Amen? That, that you'll be under the blood. Well, what does that mean to be under the blood? That means to be under the protection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I hope you're not just dependent upon your locks on your door to keep you safe. Locks, my dad told me long ago, all locks are to keep an honest person honest. A thief will break a lock, right? Hope you're not dependent upon just your locks or your plans for safety. I hope you're dependent upon the Lord. And you say, Lord, this home, this house is supposed to be a place for my safety, my protection, our family's protection, and to pray that Jesus watches over that. That's important in our day. It may become more important as the days go on. It may become more important. But remember, Jesus can protect you, and he has promised to protect you. All right? I want to show you something else in the same chapter. I want you to see that home, our home, is a place for leading and learning. You need to write that down. Our home is a place for leading and learning. It's a place for our parents to lead And for our children to learn. But hold on. It's also a place for us parents to learn. Isn't that true? (laughs) Are are y'all still learning? I I, I will tell you, when when I had my children, I learned every day. My children taught me much. They still teach me much. Teach me a lot about me, a lot about them, a lot about life. We're all learning. But the responsibility for that leading is the parents. Did y'all hear that? Let me say that one more time. The children are not supposed to be leading your family. They're not equipped. They're not ready. They'll lead one time, but, but parents are supposed to lead. God gave you that responsibility, and they need for you to lead them, all right? How do I know that? Listen to what happens here in verse 26 of this same chapter in Exodus 12. It says, And it will come about when your children will say to you, What does this right mean to you? Okay, now he said, later, whenever he's he's told them that once the Passover has happened, that they're to to observe that holiday, that right, that Passover, every year. Every year at that time, they're to observe the Passover. Okay? And whenever they observe the Passover, past the time when it literally happened, the children, as they come up in the family, they're going to ask the question, why are we doing this? Well, what, what do we do this Passover event for? Okay, they're asking, they're curious. Children are very curious. That's why they learn so much. Listen to what it says in verse 27. That you shall say, it is pass- a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes, there it is, and the people bowed low and worshipped. What is our home? It's a place for leading and learning. Parents, your responsibility is to lead. It's to direct your family, to direct your children, to help them to understand 
the things of life, and especially the most important things in life. Amen? <laughs> I mean, do not give over the responsibility of your teaching your children how to read and write just to the teachers. Do you know who's supposed to teach them that they're supposed to read and write and do math and all those other things? You are. You are. Now, all teachers do is they come along and, and they help you and they're, they're organized and they, they know what to do and, and they're encouraging them leading and our learning. and all. You want that to happen. But whose responsibility is it? It's leading you. And, and wait a minute. There's more important things than, than, than just math, isn't there? Yeah, there, there are things about how to live life and what's important in life. And there are things that are spiritual, that are eternal. And who's going to help them? Who, who's going to lead them? Who's going to teach your children about those eternal principles? You are. You're supposed to be doing that. Now, what the church is supposed to do is we're supposed to come along beside you. And we're, we're supposed to encourage your children to learn. We're supposed to encourage your children to follow your leadership. We're going to be cheerleaders for you parents, helping these children know that you as parents do the very best thing for them and that they need to listen and they need to follow what you're doing. That's what the church is all about. Matter of fact, I, I, I believe if, if a parent will commit themselves to come to church, to be in church, to have their children in church, and the church has a chance to influence their children from preschool years, oh yeah, they learn much in preschool years, all the way through childhood and all the way through youth, you're going to be you're gonna be really glad of the product that you get. You're going to be glad of the product that you get. Now, if you decide that you're going to do it on your own and you're going to go out there and do it by yourself, and every once in a while you'll show up, there's no guarantee that you're going to be excited, excited about the product you have. Let the church help you. Amen? Let the church be a part of that. But you're the one who is responsible. So what's the church going to do? The church helps you to learn how to lead. We all need help learning how to lead. Matter of fact, I, I think I'm better equipped right now. I don't want to do it. But I'm better equipped right now to be a parent than I was when I was 22, when I had our, we had our first child. I'm far better equipped right now. I do not want to do it. I don't have the energy to get up. We babysat a puppy last night for my dear wife. Thought she wanted to babysit a puppy for my daughter. I, that convinced me right then, we don't need a baby. No baby, in, we don't need babies in our house. Not to stay. We're too old for that. But I, but I know more about things. I know about what we ought to do and how we ought to emphasize things. I know more about that. The church knows things to help, help you lead. It's an awesome responsibility to have to lead your family. But you are. You're called to do that. And then it helps children to learn. It helps children to learn. D did you know that that the church and people in the church can be a, be a strong advocate to make you be better accepted in your leadership by your children. Sometimes somebody can come along and talk to them that they don't have a relationship with other than a church relationship and say, you know, you might ought to do what your parents say. It's amazing how that you've said that all along, but they hear it from somebody else. And that's what the church is all about, teaching and helping you to lead and helping children to learn. We want to what? We want them to learn the most important thing. What is the most important thing? That they need a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They need a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ so they have a home in heaven one day. We do not want our children, your children, who come through our church to learn all about math and learn all about science and learn all about those things, but miss out on the most important thing of all, giving their heart to Jesus and what's the church going to do help them to learn that help you as you lead them in that be a force for that because why because home is a place that leading takes place and a lot of learning takes place well what's the next thing I want you to look over well just I'll give you some verses write down Mark 1 29 Mark 5 38 and following and Matthew 8, Matthew 8, 3 and following. Now, 
I'll give those to you because the next part is that the home is a place for healing. The home is a place for healing. In these stories, Mark 129 is about Peter's mother-in-law being healed. And, and Mark 5, 38 and following is about Jairus' daughter being healed, even brought back to life. And Matthew 8, 3 and following is about the centurion's servant being healed by Jesus. Why do I give you those healings? Because if you'll read them when you get home, you'll find out that every one of those healings happened in their home. <laughs> Peter's mother-in-law was in his home, and Jesus healed him there. Jairus came and asked Jesus to help his daughter who was sick and eventually died, and Jesus travels to his home to minister to him. The servant of the centurion was at his home when Jesus said, go there, and he'll find that he is alive. He was healed in his home. Let's face the facts. In, in this life, there, all of us are going to need healing, aren't we? <laughs> we? We need physical healing. We, we need emotional healing. We need spiritual healing. We, we need relational healing. In this life, there's just a lot of pain. There'll be a lot of suffering. There'll be a lot of agony. Living in a sinful world is not easy. But where do we find healing? Where can we find healing that helps us, no matter what we're facing, no matter what that need is, you find it at home. You find it at home. The person who's going to care for you the most is going to be at home. The people who are your people and who love you and want to see you well, they are at your home. They're supposed to be at your home. And the church is helping that home to be healing. And, and the church is also a home for you that will help you in healing. The reality of it is, is that healing is going to be necessary in your life. As it happens, healing is going to be necessary. But where do you get healed? You're going to find far greater healing in your home than you are outside your home. One of the tragic mistakes that, especially young people, listen to me, young people, one of the tragic mistakes that young people make is that they try to find their healing outside of their home. They try to find it out there in the street somewhere. They try to find it at school somewhere. The people who care most for you, the people who are going to help you heal the most, where Jesus shows up and will minister to you, is going to be in your home. Never let loose of that. Never let go of the fact that you're needing your home. Because one day you're going to be the one who needs healing. I, I don't know of any person, I've, I've met lots of people in my, my life, but I've never met any person who has gone through life without hurt, without pain, without need of healing. If you'd say, well, I, I'm that person, i said, well, just hold on a minute. Just hold on a minute, because it's coming. That's the way life is when you live in a sinful world. Where you find healing? In your home. I want to end, though, with uh, something on a better and happier note, and that is home is a place for celebrating, all right? I hope you, I hope you learn how to celebrate in your home. That's found in Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, if you'd turn there, I'd like, I'd like for you to turn there because it's very familiar passages in Luke chapter 15. It's about three things that were lost. Do you remember that? Three things that were lost. One of those was a lost sheep, one of them was a lost coin, and one of them was a lost son. All of those about something being lost. But thank God, in every one of these stories, they were found. And I want you to see what happens whenever they're found. Look there in verse 6. This is about the lost sheep. He found the lost sheep in verse 5. Verse 6, and when he comes, what does your Bible say? What, what does your Bible say right there? When he comes what? Home, all right? When he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Okay, look at verse number 9. This is about the lost coin. 
The lady lost her coin, but she found it, verse 9. And when she found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. And then verses 23 and following is about the lost son. When the lost son came home, he said, And bring the fattened calf. Kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to be merry. Now look what happens in verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and the dancing. Where was the celebration happening? Where where did he hear it? It was coming from where? From the house. (laughs) It was coming from the house. Because the celebration happens at home. The celebration happens at home. Have you and your family developed a spirit of celebration? Do you rejoice over the victories that have been won? You rejoice over the goodness and the grace of God. There needs to be times of celebration in your family. Learn how to celebrate. Learn how to rejoice in the good things. Learn learn how to be excited about things being restored. Learn to be excited about when healing has taken place. Learn when God's provision has been given. You need to learn how to celebrate. It's a lot more fun being around a a gathering where there is celebration than it is a gathering where there is mourning. You understand that? Make your home a place of celebration. Because every one of those people, when they had something lost, whether it be a sheep or a coin or a son, every one of those people, when they found it, they brought everybody in to celebrate. And and could I just add a little note in there? You say, well, thank God we've never had anybody in our family lost and and, and then found. We haven't had that happen. Well, let, let me say this. We've all been there. Because you know what our state is? You know what our state is when we are born in this world? We are lost. That's what it tells us. We're lost in our sin. And you know what all of us need? We all need to be found by the great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not forget whenever one of your children or somebody in your family gets saved gets found, name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Do not forget to celebrate. That should be the greatest celebration of all. That should be the greatest celebration of all because that settles their eternal destiny. Some of the greatest memories you will have will be those times of celebration whenever your family came together to that point of joy and excitement. Make your family a place of celebration. Your home's supposed to be that. Each one of those things, whether it is belonging, whether it is the protection and safety, whether it's the leading and learning, whether it's the healing that has to happen, or the celebration that is our privilege. That's what a home is supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to be taking, taking care of. And on Mother's Day, as we close out, I love my church because we emphasize the family. It's appropriate for us to focus on our home. Because moms, I hope you all remember, you're the heart of the home. Amen? <laughs> you are our hearts. We, we, we men, we dads, we need you. Because we're, we're, we're like walking around with no heart. 
That's pretty hard to do. But moms are the heart. Moms have to remind us men, are we supposed to be celebrating? <laughs> have to remind us, we're, we're supposed to be leading. Remember that? Supposed to be a safe place right here. We're supposed to be healing them instead of chunking them. Moms, you're the heart of the home. And you're one of the key people who helps us to be what we ought to be as a family. I appreciate what you do. I know God equipped you to do it. I hope you'll be successful at it because your home needs it. Amen? It needs it. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the wonderful home that I had. It wasn't perfect, just like no family's perfect. But it was, it was full of love. It was full of times of celebration, safety and protection and leading and learning. I, I thank you for that. And, and I pray for any brother or sister who's here who didn't have that. I, 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 I can't fathom what it would be like. But I pray, dear God, that you give them victory over any negative thought they have about home. And that they see an open door, an open door from your family, from your home. To come and to let you be what, what they need for you to be. Heal hearts. Heal lives. Friend, today, if you don't know Jesus, would you give your heart to Jesus today? I'd love to celebrate with you that you know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Would you give your heart to Jesus today? I hope you would. I'll be here to pray with you to help you any way I can. Maybe someone who needs to join our fellowship. If God's spoken to you to be a part of the Parker family, we welcome you to come. Or, or maybe somebody just needs to come to the altar and, and pray and say, Lord, I want to be more for my family than what I've been. I want you to forgive me for things that I've said, done, acted. I want to be committed to be the best person I can be in our family. Maybe others just need to come and pray for their family. Not the family's bad. They just love their family. They want their family to be all God wants them to be, and they want to come pray for them at the altar. Whatever God leads you to do, do that now in this invitation time. Every head bowed, every eye closed, very prayerfully, very quietly, stand to your feet. As they play, I'll be here to greet you, to help you. The altar's open. You come. Wherever you are, you step out and come. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my only home. Seeking you as a precious stream. Lord, to give up my feet of me. You are my own.
here and gathering in worship and being a part of the family of God. This church is our home. We find so much that blesses us here. Help us to be the church we need to be to help our families be all that they can be. Bless our mothers this day. Thank you for them. And for every one of us who have a mother who's already gone, let's have a time just to say thank you. For those of us who have mothers who are here, let us take time to say thank you to them. Lord, bless this day and bless us as we go now to the Sunday school hour. Help us to have a good time of fellowship with one another, encouraging one another in love and good deeds. And then as we leave here to go to our mission field, school, at work, wherever we might be, let us fulfill your purpose and your plan in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I hope you'll stay for Sunday school. I hope you've enjoyed this series, I Love My Church As Much As I Have. We've em emphasized that for the past four weeks. Today our emphasis was, I love my church because we emphasize the family. We believe in family. We believe in su supporting mom and dad and the children and helping that family to become all that God wants them to be. Hope today's message spoke to you. Hope it challenged you to be a part of that family and to realize how important your family is to you. If there's some way we can help you to be the person you need to be or to be the part of that family that you are, that you need to be, please call us and let us know how we can help you. You see that number on the screen, 256-236-5628, or you also see my email address, and I'd love to hear from you, find out what way we can minister to you, or how maybe we've already ministered to you through the Word of God. It's a privilege for us to come each week into your home and be able to bless you, I pray, by and through the Word of God and the worship of Christ. May you have a great week.